So our first question, somebody wrote in and said, hello, in autism, is it normal that the autistic child doesn't recognize their parents? So that's an interesting question because I don't know if it's not in recognizing parents because it could be that they're just not responding the way that you're expecting them to. I think most of our kids know who their parents are. Um, it's just that their response is not the social norm. So it's really looking and seeing how they're responding to you. But on the other end, I know it's, the research is like probably at least 10 or 15 years old. I haven't looked at it. One of the, um, I remember sitting in this lecture, and it was at UCSD, and what this professor did was they showed faces to people on the autism spectrum to see where in their brain faces lit up. Mm -hmm. And in the autism spectrum, it was everywhere. Mm -hmm. There was no consistent place. So sometimes faces would show up in the motor area. Sometimes it would show up in the vision area. Sometimes it would show up in the emotional area. And that gives you an idea of just some kind of wiring that is just not right. And so many of our kids don't look at faces. Or if they're looking at faces, they're looking at one little part, and that's how they're using to, mm -hmm. to identify people. So a lot of times in just facial recognition, we do have kids who have what they call um, nonverbal learning disorder, where uh, they don't see faces and body language and anything that's nonverbal information. They're not making the inference and connecting it to um, mean something. You know, and I've had kids on the autism spectrum who have like 100, their IQs are in the top 99.9%, .9 and they've looked at me and they're like little kids, and they'll tell me, I don't understand that. We all speak English, so why would we need these nonverbal cues that you're talking about? Right. Right. <laughs> you know, why do we need facial expressions when yeah. we have words? And, you know, and I, there's so many kids where I, I watch them see faces, and when they're talking about it, it's not what I'm seeing. Yeah you know, and their interpretation of what they see. And our kids also like routines. Mm -hmm. And like in the same way when they're outside, if I ask them what they're looking at, they're usually naming like their favorite things, but they also tend to name things that don't change. The grass is green, the sky is blue. And I'm telling them, hey, when you have conversations, you don't talk about things that never change. You talk, the interesting, interesting. things See, are the things, things that we wouldn't think about, yeah. but yeah. You talk about the new and the novel and something unusual and I've had kids tell me, but why? Yeah. <laughs> like, they don't want the things, they don't want to identify the things that change. And I just think faces change all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. I, there's been a tremendous amount of research lately about neurotypical people and faces and facial expression. I know we covered last year, there was a study where they showed people um, pictures of athletes in moments of triumph, but they blocked out their eyes mm. and they asked, how are they feeling? And this was of neurotypical people. And with the eyes not there, they got it wrong almost all the time. Wow. Now, I, you know, I thought it would be interesting if you did the same thing with people on the autism spectrum to see if they also got it wrong or if they got it more right. Yeah. Right? We And we had a gentleman on, um, gosh, I'll have to go back and find the interview, but he's a doctor in Ireland, if I'm not mistaken, or Scotland, who this is just what he looks at. And and he's written a little, uh, it's a literally a booklet that you get and you, you know, uh, you just print out because okay. it's a booklet that he's written um, about how people on the spectrum sometimes what they see and he shows you pictures of you know where we're looking at a picture of somebody and we see the eyes and the nose and the mouth and for them some for some people it's a pinwheel that it all blends together or that it it's more like a picasso mm, interesting Do you know um, and he's had tremendous luck with folks on the spectrum. You know how when we discovered that with dyslexia, that if you put different colored pieces of paper, then the, the words would stop jumping around for some people. Um, he's done colored glasses for individuals on the spectrum and it immediately stopped their toe walking. Yeah. And they could immediately see a different field of vision. Yeah. We have That's a lot crazy. of kids actually. No, a lot of our kids have visual sensory um, issues. And yeah, the colored glasses, we've had a lot of kids on that. I mean, some of our kids don't see three dimensional, they only see two dimensional. And then it's not until we test them, at, you know, with this yeah. vision testing that we realize you, if you don't see corners, you don't see three dimensional, how do you get through? But we had a parent come in and say, actually, he didn't know 
that things were three-dimensional until he ended up with glasses but in oh. his 30s. So he'd been driving and everything, oh my gosh. but he, ha he had all these other type of markers to show him like where to stop with lines when he was driving and everything. He had a whole other set of rules. And it wasn't until he realized something was wrong with his vision that they were corrected that he didn't know things yeah. were three-dimensional. Yeah, well, I've also heard people talk about kids who um, are seeing two of something, and it isn't until they go to the developmental ophthalmologist that they realize, oh, they're seeing double vision and they need corrective lenses to see one, but they thought that everybody could see two. Yeah, I actually have double vision. But yeah. I didn't know I had double vision until I was in college and the doctor, when he was looking at my eyes, because I didn't need glasses. And he's like, you see too? And I said, I do. I just never. And he's like, your brain just adjusted. Wow. But I didn't know. But it's only for things that are far away. It's a really wow. crazy thing. <laughs> that is a very funny thing. But I have to say, this brings me to the next thing that, you know, one of the things on our journey, I remember a time when you referred us to a developmental ophthalmologist. Am I getting it right? Op ophthalmologist. Is it, it's, optometrist. Is it optometrist. Um, so that my son could get tested, and then we found out that he, his eye muscles were not strong enough to mm -hmm. focus. Um, cause, so that's part of why whenever he would look at things, he would look at them here because he, it was too hard for him otherwise. Yes. And, and then we did eye exercises mm -hmm. because we went to that, um, that doctor, uh, and it never had occurred to me that, and the doctor was like, he showed me my son sitting in a chair, and he had the, the, like two balls on the end of these sticks, and one was gold and one was silver, and he would pass them um, and say to my son, don't move your body, just move your eyes to follow these. And it was tragic, you guys, to watch my son because he was like, this trying to yeah. see it right um, because that's the only way that he could see it and he said imagine my son was a very good reader by that point he said the fact that this young man can read shows that it was a powerful desire for him to want to read he should be struggling with reading yeah um, so something else to look at yeah no so many of our kids actually when they come in with visual stereotypy uh, you know I can't go into it here but I, there are a lot of kids that come in and during an intake, I'll be like, <laughs> yeah. you know, just things I've picked up over the years. Yes. And then I will refer them because I'm like, he doesn't see. Yeah. Like, or there's just something that's not working right. And yeah. I don't know what it is. But yeah, I always encourage families, you know, there's not enough of these people in the world. And it's hard for them to know how to manage behaviors of a kid if a kid has a lot of behaviors that's yeah. on the spectrum. But when you can find a developmental vision um, optometrist who actually works with kids with usually learning delays, ADHD, you know, whatever it may be, if you can get them evaluated, it makes a huge difference. We have so many families. And even the optometrists, because I'll send them no matter what age. Yeah. I'm, I'm not regulated by that. Right. And, um, you know, the optometrist like that's local, he always says, I'm so amazed by the kids that come from you because... In the optometry world, a lot of people will say, by this age, it should be set. Yeah. But your kids actually continue to make progress yeah. into their teens, yeah. and you see it keep changing. And that's not what would be known in, like, the typical world. Interesting. And, um, but he always tells me, like, they can keep coming as long as they keep improving. Yeah. And he says a lot of them just keep making that progress through their teen years. It's kind of amazing. It is. So going back to this question about is it normal if a child doesn't recognize their parents? So we don't know if it's just that their reaction is different or they really truly are having some of this visual um, difference. But what I, what I hear here is the parents, like I'm they reading want. between the lines, it's sad if your child, because, you know, we mm -hmm. all want that thing we want where we come parents. in the room. I can remember going to pick up my nephew at daycare and him saying, it's Aunt Fannin, it's Aunt Fannin, <laughs> and running across the room and going, oh, Aunt Fannin. And I thought, oh, someday I'm going to have a child and get this reaction too. And I didn't. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the reaction I got because my son always thinks of, even now, thinks of, I'm going to be there. Like, he, he's shocked when I'm not. He's like, what happened? Where's mom? Why is she not here? You know what I mean? So there wasn't that big reaction. So there's so part of this, I read sadness into this. Mm -hmm. Because if your child I isn't do. running into your arms, sometimes that's a real, like, oh, you know, what's you miss happening? It. Yes. You want it. And that's normal. Yes. You know, that's typical. And, I mean, it's, it's a way that we read love. 
Of course. And and respect. And sometimes, respect. especially from the dads, that they're like, he's not even looking at me, so he doesn't respect me. Yeah. Um, so part, you know, part of that is the grief and dealing with that. But this can be worked on either way, Definitely. no matter which way it is. So what, what advice would we have them? Um, talk to their ABA provider and say, let's let, you know, can you evaluate and see which one of these you think it is? Yeah, and just, um, I've taught kids to go running into their parents' arms, mm -hmm. you know, and out of session. Yes. Because especially if you're in a session, parents usually aren't a part of it all the time. Yeah. So there, the opportunity is really high yeah. with every break that you have, if the parent's around, or if at the end of a session and the parent comes to pick up and just say, this is what you're supposed to do. When you yes. see your parents, you run to them and you greet them. Yes. You know, you say hi and you like go grab them. Yes. And this is what's appropriate. There you go. You know, and, you and then we them. reinforce that. We reinforce that and then we tell them it's only the parents. Yes. <laughs> Not to strangers. Right. And then that's what's later on. But it's at the beginning, it's just we can say like if this is family, you yeah. know, that's who they have they're familiar with. And that I, and most of the kids I've worked with, I'd, I'd say all the kids I work with do recognize their parents. It's just that the response is not, it's very muted yeah. um, or just different. Yeah. You know, so. Uh, it's, my son took a long time to know other people. Mm -hmm. So for instance, you know, our, like his uncles and his aunts, he, and even someone that he really, really liked, a friend of mine who was very fun and played with him a lot, um, he hadn't seen her in probably a week and then she was someplace where he didn't expect her to be. We went to a party and I remember he looked up, up at her and he said, I love you, but he didn't know who mm. she was. He just knew you're somebody that I'm happy to see, but he couldn't say her name and that was a bummer for her for the longest time. Mm. She was like, I don't understand why he doesn't know my name. But I, then when he said, when he looked up at her and he said, I... I love you. <laughs> it was just so this cute. funny thing of like you could read all the subtext. It was like, I'm not sure who you are and I'm not used to seeing you here, but I know that you're somebody that my heart yeah. beats faster when I see. That made it a little bit better for her. But anyway, I guess my point is that our, our kids get there in the way that they get there and we should be willing to see what, you know, what it is. But if they need more help, go to see a developmental Optician. Optometrist. Optometrist. See, there's all <laughs> ophthalmologists, op, yeah, whatever. So, uh, op, which one? Optometrist. Optometrist. <laughs> Developmental like vision optometrist. Okay. Um, and I know our insurance paid for it. Mm -hmm. So, um, don't be afraid uh, to at least ask. Okay. We're going to take a short break and then we're going to come back with more of your questions after these messages. Stick with us. Thanks for watching Autism Live. To subscribe, click here. And if you'd like to check out some more of our videos, click here.